Hello and welcome to episode 4 of Slang Cap Q&A where I try to answer your questions from the comfort of my flowery sofa. So come in, take a few, get comfy. Today I've got a question from somebody called Matthew who wants to know the differences between collectivism and communism in a way. But we'll be getting into that. First, a word from our sponsors. Got prax? Get tested and get clean with our new home testing kits. Prax can kill if left untreated, so get yours today for a price that the market has decided you can afford. The kit includes one oral testing strip to measure the fecal content of verbal utterances, two lubricated suppositories to aid the removal of your head from your anus, and one tube of vaginal fresh cream to get rid of that irritating cunt. <laughs> question from Matthew that I'll have a look at now. Uh, okay, he's saying, I am an anarcho-communist with lean... No, sorry, he's quoting me, because I said uh, in the status where I asked you to send questions in a long time ago now, um, I mentioned that I am an anarcho-communist, anarchist-communist, with leaning to, uh, leanings sorry, towards collectivist anarchism. And he says, what? Stop being redundant. Anarcho-communism is a form of collectivist anarchism. I don't think it is. Uh, I can see where you're coming from. Anarchist communism definitely has its roots in collectivist anarchism, but I don't think that's accurate to say that anarcho-communism is a form of collectivist anarchism. Because if it was, that would imply that there are other forms of anarchist communism. Or oh, sorry, there are other forms of collectivist anarchism if anarcho-communism is one of them. What are the others? I've never heard of any others. Um, so, I mean, you're right in a way that anarchist communism grew out of collectivist anarchism in the same way that collectivist and individualist anarchism grew out of mutualism. But it's not redundant to make distinctions between them because there are key differences. Um, and, you know, they're the differences that led to changes w within the International Working Men's Association from one current of anarchist thought to another, as happened a few times. Uh, the collectivist current of anarchist thought had become like the main one, like the proper one at the time. And that's about the time that Bakunin was there having disagreements with Marx and whatnot, because Marx was saying some really awesome stuff about capitalism. Uh, but then he was all like, oh, let's have a transitional state, a dictatorship of the proletariat. And Bakunin was just like, fuck you, statist, we're not doing that. Um, and then Malatesta and others from the Italian section of the First International, they had another view that differed from Bakunin's as well. But they were polite enough to wait for Bakunin to die before making their differences of opinion known. Um, I think Bakunin was a bit like the casual racist of the party who's a bit kind of nice in other ways but built like a brick shit house. so he's the kind of person where like if you disagreed with him you'd probably wait until he died before saying anything about it so anyway uh, Bakunin popped his clogs and that's when the anarchist communist current emerged from the collectivist current so, while collectivism was like a branch of Proudhonian mutualism, Malatesta and eventually Kropotkin wanted to return to Joseph de Gere's earlier... De, de Jacques? De Gere? Joseph de Gere. I don't know how you pronounce that. Um, but it's spelt like de Jacques, but it's got an accent on it, and I heard a narco pack say it once, and then he's normally right about stuff. Um, so I think it's Joseph de Gere. De, de Gere. I don't know. I'll write it down for you so you can see it. Joseph de Jacques. So yeah, they wanted to return to his earlier critique of Proudhon's ideas. Um, I've got a quote here from an essay called Anarchist Communism by Alan Pengham. I'll put a link to that in the description. And a quote in there that says... Uh, Joseph de Jacques. De Jacques work was an examination of the limits of the 19, sorry, the 1848 revolution and the reasons for its failure. It was developed around the rejection of two things, the state, even if revolutionary, and collectivism of the prudenist type. Ooh, Bob Dickens. Uh, it also says that uh, his general definition of the anarchic community 
was the state of affairs where each would be free to produce and consume at will and according to their fantasy, without having to exercise or submit to any control whatsoever over anything whatever, where the balance between production and consumption would establish itself no longer by preventive and arbitrary detention at the hands of some group or other, but by the free circulation of the faculties and needs of each. I think that sounds quite nice. Pengham argues that this definition of the anarchic community implies a criticism of Proudhon's ideas, which were centred on the reward of labour power and the problem of exchange value. Proudhon and the co were having a bit of a back and forth about women's emancipation. Um, I think you can read the letters that they wrote to each other. It's getting a bit tasty, like they might have to have a fight. Uh, because the cur, it says here, Joseph de Jacques. He urged Proudhon to push on as far as the abolition of the contract, the abolition not only of the sword and of capital, but of property and authority in all their forms, and refuted the commercial and wages logic of the demand for a fair reward for labour. The collectivist anarchists had been happy to go along with this idea of being rewarded for the work that you can actually do, but then the cur was just like, no, fuck that, it's not the product of his or her labour that the worker has a right to, but to the satisfaction of his or her needs, whatever may be their nature. So that's a bit of background to the differences to start off with. The collectivist anarchists were followers of Proudhon, whereas the anarchist communists were feeling that it was better to go back and have another look at de Kerr's ideas and criticisms of Proudhon. The collectivist anarchists wanted collective ownership of productive means, meaning that the body of people working within a given means of production would own that particular one, while anarchist communists wanted the means of production to be in common ownership, so owned by everybody and nobody in particular. One thing to mention about collectivism that people do get a bit confused about is that it does not mean that the collective can gang up on the individual. I mentioned this in a previous video, that a collective is made up of individuals and exists to satisfy their individual needs, otherwise what's the point? Um, of course not every individual in the collective can get exactly what they want all the time, because it's just life, it's not that perfect, but if you're invited to be involved and take part in making decisions that affect your life, then it can hardly be called the tyranny of the majority if you have to compromise a bit sometimes. Um, surely that's much better than all of the decisions just being made for you and handed down to you from on high, right? The second thing to mention is that collectivism in the sense of collective ownership, in the sense that the collectivist anarchists advocated, doesn't mean that the collective is able to take the product of the individual's labour and redistribute it as the collective sees fit. Collective anarchist, collectivist anarchists, sorry, did not advocate this at all. Quite the opposite, in fact. They did want collective ownership of the means of production, meaning that each means of production would be owned collectively by the people that work in it. But as I mentioned, they did not advocate the product of every worker's labour being pulled together and shared equally. They wanted each worker to receive full remuneration for the work that they actually do. I think I already mentioned that the mutualist and collectivists were more about from each according to their ability to each according to their deed, rather than to each according to their need. The mantra didn't really become from each according to their ability to each according to their need uh, until such a time that the anarchist communist current was introduced. Um, I think it was because they didn't feel at the time that it was possible for production to guarantee the satisfaction of everybody's needs. Bakunin did entertain the idea of a post-revolutionary system for distribution according to need, but in the short term he thought that people should receive remuneration according to their deeds until such a time that production becomes greater than consumption, and then everyone can just take what they need without fear of running out and depriving everyone else. But of course the anarchist communists disagreed that there might not be enough to satisfy everyone's needs, and many of us feel today that it is now possible to satisfy everyone's needs, due to developments in technology. Um, I think anarchist communism is probably more relevant today in that sense because production is greater than the demand in industrialised countries where so much is wasted. It's clear that we actually have more than we need when so much of it ends up on the scrap heap. So imagine how much more than that we would have if there wasn't that minority group, that elite proprietary, cl uh, proprietary class and political class that hoard so much to themselves. So, you see, there are some key differences between these two schools of anarchist thought. The collectivist anarchists didn't advocate the evolution of currency in the short term, like most anarchist communists do. And if I've understood correctly, the collectivists did advocate a kind of wage system. 
except not really a wage system as such, if we take the word wage to imply a portion of the value of the work that you do, rather than the full value. The anarchist communists, on the other hand, thought that any kind of wage system would be inherently statist and hierarchical, in the sense that somebody would have to be tasked with handling the financial administration and deciding how much each person's labour is worth and then giving it to them. Anarchist communists like Kropotkin argued that this would require a form of currency, which they opposed, and that this system would require a kind of state to decide whose work is worth what and uh, how much they deserve. But Malatesta and the early anarchist communists said that instead of getting bogged down in who does what and for how long, workers could just pull the product of their work together and each take what they need. Malatesta said, Instead of running the risk of making a confusion in trying to distinguish what you and I each do, let us all work and put everything in common. In this way, each will give to society all that his strength permits, until enough is produced for everyone and each will take all that he needs, limiting his needs only in those things of which there is not yet plenty for everyone. It might seem idealistic to us to think that people wouldn't try to take more than they need, even if it would leave others short, but we're looking at it from the perspective of only ever having lived in a competitive capitalist economy, or I am. Um, maybe a sense of community, solidarity and reciprocity would emerge naturally if the means of production and the land were publicly owned and being cooperative was more beneficial to people than being competitive. The anarchist communists wanted everybody to have access to what they need to survive, regardless of how much productive work they're able to put in. It's arguable, at least, that everybody does some kind of productive work that contributes to society, even if it's not traditionally regarded as productive work. Um, as I said, while collectivist anarchism focused on the collectivization of property ownership with the means of production owned by particular groups that use them, the anarcho-communists wanted the land and the means of production to be owned by no one in particular, no, ind no particular individual or group, but by everyone in common, so that everyone could access and make use of them. Personally, I do lean towards the collectivist idea that we should be paid for the work that we actually do, unless there's enough for everyone regardless but there kind of is enough for everyone regardless now. Um, this was true when Kropotkin and everyone was saying it in the 1800s, and it's even more true today now that technology has developed so much. The problem, as far as I can see, is not going to be figuring out how to produce enough to go around, but how to avoid producing too much. That seems to be the problem at the moment. So I think we should meet in the middle on this argument. I think that people should be guaranteed the fulfilment of their basic needs in the first instance, but then with what's left of the product of our collective work, we could agree to split that between the workers, paying them a, sh a share that is in accordance with the work that they've actually done, on top of getting their basic needs met. I don't think that this would necessarily require any form of currency or state apparatus. It could be agreed between the groups who work there by consensus. People are obviously a lot more agreeable when their opinions are considered and their needs are being met, and would hopefully be more inclined to be generous to each other in a society with no bosses and no state, no forced taxation or expropriated labour product by a private owner. People couldn't defer responsibility to a third party mediator, but would have to take responsibility for their own communities themselves if they're all left in charge. The anarchist FAQ on the InfoShop website compares and contrasts collectivist anarchism with communist anarchism this way. It says, The major differences between collectivists and communists is over the question of money after a revolution. Anarcho-communists consider the abolition of money to be essential, while anarcho-collectivists consider the end of private ownership of the means of production to be the key. As Kropotkin noted, collectivist anarchism expresses a state of things in which all necessaries for production are owned in common by the labour groups and the free communes, while the ways of retribution, i.e. distribution of labour, communist or otherwise, would be settled by each group for itself. So, while communism and collectivism both organise production in common via producers' associations, they differ in how the goods produced will be distributed. Communism is based on free consumption of all, for all, while collectivism is more likely to be, ba uh, to be based on the distribution of goods according to the labour that you actually contributed. However, most anarcho-collectivists think that over time, as productivity increases and the sense of community becomes stronger, money will disappear. 
So I hope that clears up some confusion as to the differences between collectivist anarchism and anarchist communism. While they are linked to each other, and they both definitely qualify as anarchist philosophies, they do differ in several key ways. Anarcho-communists want to abolish money as soon as possible, collectivist anarchists want to wait and see if the idea just kind of dies out. Uh, Anarcho-communists want the means of production to be owned in common, collectivist anarchists want them to be owned by those who work in them. Anarchist communists want everybody to get what they need, collectivist anarchists want everybody to get what they produce. Um, yeah, so they're not the same. Okay, let me know in the comments if that answers your question or not. If not, then I'll maybe try and have another crack at it. Or if you've got any other questions that you want answered, uh, yeah, stick them in the comment. Uh, there's some links in the description to the things that I've talked about if you want to have a little read around those. Um, yeah, so I haven't got the right t-shirt on today to do my subscribe here thing, but I think you can subscribe up there if you want to. Um, God, I'm never sure how to end these things. It's like an awkward thing at the end of a telephone conversation. No, you hang up. No, you hang up. Go on, you hang up. No, you. You. All right, I'll hang up.